there was really, you know, listening to the patient. Antibiotic use, did they have a lot of ear infections? Did they have a lot of strep throat? Did they get a lot of antibiotics? Uh, what's going on in the family? Did anybody else in the family have any digestive issues? Um, so just taking the time to get that history allows you to sort of play detective and try to figure out, okay, what are the things that are potentially playing a role in driving this and what might have triggered it? And then personalizing, you know, diagnostics and treatment and everything else. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. And that's pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. And if you've ever suffered from digestive problems, from irritable bowel syndrome, bloating, and discomfort, you better listen to this podcast carefully because it is a special podcast of the Doctor's Pharmacy, which I call the House Call Series. And I'm sitting down with my colleagues from the Ultra Wellness Center in Lenox, Massachusetts. And today I'm joined by Dr. Todd Lapine to discuss how we as functional medicine doctors, tackle specific conditions we see at our practice every single day. And I'm going to focus today on irritable bowel because that is affecting so many people. It's the number one reason people actually go to the doctor is digestive complaints. Yeah. It's a big problem and it causes disability uh, and dysfunction and misery for so many people and it's fixable. So Todd, uh, Todd is a great friend and colleague. We work together for pushing on almost 30 years now. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> We're still standing. Still He's alive. an extraordinary physician, a leader and thinker in the field of functional medicine. He graduated from Dartmouth Medical School. He's board certified in functional medicine. And he uh, worked with me at Kenya Ranch for many years. He teaches all over the world uh, in various faculties and is just a brilliant functional medicine physician. And I'm honored to have him as part of our center here at the Ultra Wellness Center. So Todd, welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy again. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. Okay. So let's talk about this thing called irritable bowel syndrome. What did we learn about it in medical school? Uh, not much. I mean, we, we, I think we, ba we basically learned that it was one of those uh, conditions where uh, you sort of treat the patient and it's not serious. You're not going to die from it. And uh, I can remember actually up at Dartmouth, uh, we had uh, Dr. Almy and he was a, um, an expert in irritable bowel. Mm. And back then it was felt to be more of a sort of uh, neurologic sort of like stress related thing. Psycho-emotional. Psycho-emotional. And he actually, I'll tell you, this is a very interesting side story. He did a, 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 a test uh, where he took some medical students and was measuring the manometry of them. And while he was doing the sigmoidoscopy, uh, he was measuring the, the tension in the, in, the, in the colon. And then he, while doing the, and this, you can only do this to medical students, and this is back in the 50s. Um, and he uh, told them, he goes, I think I see cancer. And all of a sudden there was a spasm of the colon. Oh. Yeah. And it was and it was like he wanted to evoke to see what it was, what was going on with the irritable bowel. And they thought it was a lot of it was nervous related, and which yeah. there is a, there's a stress component. And uh, so back then, the a concept of irritable bowel was that it was all sort of in your head. It's all sort yeah. of like in we, your we head. had a very uh, fancy word for it in medical school. We called it supratentorial, which is a doctor's way of saying it's all in your head. It's all in your head. The tentorium is that thing that kind of separates your top of your brain from the lower brain. <laughs> and right. It was a joke, right. but it was very pejorative. And we often thought that these patients were malingers. Uh, it was called functional bowel disease. Yeah, yeah a lot of, I mean, a lot of terms. Just, there was no real cause for it. It was more right. psychological yeah. and maybe stress-related. And these people are all emotional and upset. Turns out it's not so, right? right. And, we, and we call it syndrome, right? Syndrome, so yeah. So what, when we say syndrome in medicine, what do, what do we mean? <laughs> It's a constellation of various symptoms, and you know we we now yeah, we don't know what the hell's going we don't, on. We don't know what it's like. Yeah, it's like it's like you know chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, it's like you know how many different things can cause chronic fatigue. It's, it's like there's 23 flavors or how many flavors of Baskin Robbins ice cream. Same thing with uh, 31. Robbins. I used yeah, to 31. Be, uh, I used to scoop Baskin Robbins ice cream. That's right. one of my jobs. Right, right, and then that'll, the that'll probably before. cause irritable bowel. <laughs> <laughs> probably <laughs> about those artificial of, artificial yes. flavorings and, <laughs> and sugar. So uh, yeah, so uh, and you know nowadays we sort of classify irritable bowel into uh, irritable bowel with constipation, irritable bowel with diarrhea, and then mixed irritable bowel. That's how we're sort of, mm -hmm. you know, putting an ICD-10 code on it. Um, and, and that's a, a way of conceptualizing it. But there are lots of different things that play a role. Without question, I think stress does play a role with irritable bowel. Um, and I think that, you know, stress can manifest in the body in so many different ways. We talk, we've talked about this when we talk about autoimmune conditions, because oftentimes when we have a patient and some stressful event happens, it triggers a host of things and sort of like a, 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 a ripple effect that goes on in the body. And without question, there, there is a stress component to some irritable bowel 
Well, yeah, I mean, you've got your second brain in your gut. There's more serotonin in your gut than in your brain. You've got this whole nervous system that connects the two that is extraordinarily complex and feeds back both ways. So from the top down and bottom up. So irritable bowel can cause irritable brain and irritable brain causes irritable bowel. It goes back and forth. Right. And you want to have a happy bowel, a happy brain. That's, that's, you know, that's really Sounds like the key to a happy life. Happy happy bowel is happy brain. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And then, yeah. And there is that, it's an interesting thing that you talk about because you have that gut brain connection and it's like a two way highway and they're, they're basically communicating the brain's talking to the gut and the gut's talking to the brain. And then you also have the enteric nervous system. Mm. And, and some people sort of forget about the enteric nervous system and that's the intrinsic nervous system to the gut. So literally, if you if you sever the uh, spinal column and there is no connection to the gut and the brain, the gut still works. You can still you know poop uh, fine if you if you sever the spinal. It's got, column. got a mind of its own. It's got a mind of its own exactly. <laughs> right. But you know, Todd, I want to come back to what you said, which is really important. You said, you know, we categorize irritable bowel as with constipation or diarrhea or whatever, and there's a whole classification system that that is driven off of symptoms. Yeah. And the difference between functional medicine and conventional medicine thinking about any disease is that it's not focused on the symptoms, it's focused on the causes. So just saying people have irritable bowel doesn't tell you anything about the cause. It tells you they feel uncomfortable, they're bloated, they have diarrhea, their bowels are weird, they're they're uncomfortable, cramping, whatever the symptoms are, is irrelevant when it comes to trying to figure out the cause. I mean, yeah. You, you, yeah, okay, you have irritable bowel, but that's when you start to think about the problem in traditional medicine, you name the disease, you stop thinking. Right. You know, and our, our colleague Sid Baker always had this great term. He says, you know, f- traditional medicine is naming and blaming. You name uh, the disease and then you blame the name for the problem. Oh, I know why your stomach hurts. You have irritable bowel syndrome. No, that's just the name of the t- problem. Exactly. <laughs> but but he talks about thinking and linking, which is functional medicine, right? Yeah. You've think about the problem and the cause once you get the diagnosis and you link everything together to see what the factors are. And there's no such thing as irritable bowel syndrome. There's irritable bowel syndromes. Right. Like you said, there's 31 flavors <laughs> and, and each one is different and each one needs to be treated differently. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's so, so, so true. And, you, and there is this, you know, this web-like uh, interaction in the body and it's, it's very important to understand uh, the, the whole interconnectedness uh, of it. It's very, very important. So, so typically you go to the doctor and you have irritable bowel. Um, what do the, what do they tell you to do? Well, you know, they, they, you know, they, they'll, they'll often tell you, you know, take some Metamucil and I'll see you later. That's that's, yeah, that's eat more fiber, drink more water. Yeah, that's and, that's uh, essentially learn assen- to live with it. And yeah, that's uh, essentially what they're deal doing. with stress. <laughs> yeah, that deal with stress. Yeah, and, and they'll they'll I, the interesting thing. This is I had a patient just the other day uh, who I was seeing for um, uh, GI symptoms. Um, it wasn't specifically irritable bowel, and the patient's GI doctor said diet has nothing to do with your symptoms. I mean, it was uh, it was unbelievable that a GI doctor told her. Diet makes no difference. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I just, I like. <laughs> actually, actually, I was on a, 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 a consult with a patient yesterday, and she said, I went to my gastroenterologist and I, I wanted to show my stool test. He says, Oh, gastroenterologists don't look at stool. I'm like, Well, then who does <laughs> if you're a doctor? And I'm like, You know, that just doesn't make sense. You don't look at what goes in and you don't look at what comes out. How are you supposed to know what's going on in there, right? Yeah. And that's the difference in functional medicine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's it really it's it's sort of it's a little bit mind blowing. And yeah, you know, you talk about like, you know, uh, with going back to Sid Baker and sort of name it and, and claim it kind of a, a thing is blame it. Yeah, name it, name it and blame it. Um, is that you know And then tame it with a drug. <laughs> right. And then I I always I always tell my patients, you know, I went from being a medical student to a student of medicine. I'm sorry, I'd like to always learn about things. Well, I love and, that. And yeah, and it, and it's a very important thing that you have to remain open minded and I think you also have to remain curious. Because every patient's different. That's you know that's actually the the joy of actually practicing functional medicine is it's not boring no. by any means. It, it, it's a, it's you're you're constantly growing and learning and helping patients with the latest diagnostics, the latest therapeutics to to personalize their treatment, and that's the fun part. I mean, fun, doing functional medicine is a wonderful uh, profession uh, as opposed to regular mainstream medicine where most doctors are burned out. You know, they really are. They're just, they're unhappy. They're, they're burned out. They're, they're doing rubber stamp medicine. You know, I'll see you. Here's your proton pump inhibitor. Next, next patient. That's, yeah, right. that's it. Right. That's it. 
So, you know, doctor sees you, you have irritable bowel, they give you Metamucil. What else can they do sometimes? Well, sometimes they'll give uh, prescription medications. Uh, I think one of the older ones that they used to do for IBS was Zelnorm. Remember that one? Yeah. They took it off the market because it was like really hurting people. I think people were getting... Librium uh, was the other one. Remember Librium. that? That was, yeah. a, that was a, like a Valium. It was yeah. basically like taking Valium. <laughs> is, that, is it Valium for the gut? Yeah, Valium. Yeah, I mean, and I, they're actually, in certain patients, uh, there were some benefits from that because it did sort of calm down uh, the nervous system, I think. Uh, sure, that, anybody, that, that, anybody taking Valium. <laughs> yeah, you're going to feel, I feel good. <laughs> a couple of shots of tequila, a little Librium. I, I feel good. <laughs> uh, right. But that's really not what we do with no. functional medicine. You're, you know, you were talking before about how you never know what the issue is when someone comes in. I was thinking about it. It's much like Forrest Gump medicine. You know, Forrest Gump has a box of chocolates. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know which one you're going to get. And I think in, in traditional medicine, you got irritable bowel. That's a thing. You treat it all the same. Functional medicine is not like that. We right. see someone with irritable bowel, and then we go, wait a minute. What is the cause of their irritable bowel? And like right. you were saying before, it's very personalized. Right. So how do we start to think about identifying what their particular issues are? Because before we can even treat it, we have to understand the why. And that yeah. is what I always say. Functional medicine is the medicine of why, and regular medicine is the medicine of what. What disease and what drug. And, and I think the big thing is time. Taking the time to talk to a patient. And, you know, what? Most, talk to a patient? Uh, actually, and, and listen to the patient. That's wow, actually, listen to the patient. That's, that's actually, you know, that actually and sometimes the less I talk during a, 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 an interview and, a, you know, a evaluation of a patient, the better I do because, yeah. you know, oftentimes we want to jump in and ask this question. They'll oh say something God. and we ask a question. You know, I think at the, in the average doctor's office, a, a patient speaks for like 30 seconds. And the doctor interrupts them. Yeah, no, actually, I, there was a study published years ago in JAMA. It was 18 yeah. seconds 18 se 20 before seconds, yeah. the doctor interrupts. Exactly, because, you know, we're, we're, we're trained to like, you know, probe the questions and, and, you know, they have their own sort of path of thinking going down that. But I think the, the big thing is, you know, we spend a lot of time listening to the patients and getting a history and a story. And, you know, an important thing is an interesting thing in terms of IBS patients is that uh, babies who have colic and they've actually looked at what is it that causes colic in babies? You know, it, you know, and yeah. the latest uh, evidence is that babies that have colic have high levels of Klebsiella. Klebsiella is a bacteria. Mm. And we know that Klebsiella is actually associated with other inflammatory conditions and autoimmune conditions. So Klebsiella excess in the gut is actually associated with ankylosing spondylitis, which yeah. is inflammatory bowel disease, which manifests systemically with uh, arthritic symptoms. So getting a history of colic is important. Mm. Uh, listening to uh, the history of, you know, were they vaginally birthed? Were they breastfed? Um, what type of diet did they have as a kid? And when did they get food introduced? Was uh, yeah, like, yeah, and all those things can play a role in terms of like early gluten, for or, yeah, example, exactly. early dairy, yeah, exactly, really it, trigger a leaky it, gut, exactly, and and just there's really you know listening to the patient antibiotic use. Did they have a lot of ear infections? Did they have a lot of strep throat? Did they get a lot of antibiotics? Uh, what's going on in the family? Did anybody else in the family have any digestive issues? Um, so just taking the time to get that history allows you to sort of play detective and try to figure out, okay, what are the things that are potentially playing a role in driving this and what might have triggered it? And then personalizing, you know, diagnostics and treatment and everything else. It's it's all about personalization. I think it's very, very different what you're what you're saying. This approach really is is being a medical detective. Absolutely. And and, and, and it is relevant whether you're breastfed or for example, or vaginally birthed, because that affects your gut flora and the development for your whole life. I mean I I recently read a study that showed bottle-fed babies have a high levels of a what we call a short-chain fat, which is made by the good bacteria. This one is called propionic acid. Now, this is not such a good one, and it's been shown to induce autism in animal studies and has been so associated with autism and ADD. That is increased when you're bottle feeding. When you breastfeed, you get increased in butyrate, which is the beneficial short-chain fat that actually heals the gut. And Absolutely. Is, reduces inflammation, does all sorts of good things. So we think, oh, it's the difference, bottle fed, breastfed. That's not to make people feel guilty if they have to bottle feed. You have to do it sometimes. But you can fix that by making sure they have the right prebiotics and the right probiotics. Because breast milk has undigestible fibers that are prebiotics yeah. and sugars that are prebiotics for the good bugs they, they, that aren't actually digested by humans. So Absolutely. Breast milk and knows that. <laughs> exactly. And, and the other interesting thing about breast milk, I mean, you know, if we could, if we could um, sort of bottle breast milk, uh, it's very, very powerful stuff. There's, there's a thing in breast milk called milk oligosaccharides, and these are very, very complex yes. sugar moieties, uh, sugar chemicals. 
And they're actually so complex that for a, a long time, science didn't even study them because we, they were too complex. It was like this, you know, a Lego set that was this incredible uh, building blocks. And what they've done now, there are a couple of companies, uh, one company in specific out of uh, Europe that's actually synthesized one of the uh, oligosaccharides in milk. And there are actually hundreds of them. Um, and these act like uh, fertilizer for the uh, good bacteria. So these, uh, these, these things that are found in breast milk are very, very powerful things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So powerful. And so, so we dig down into the story and figure out when did it start and what's connected to it. Did you have foreign travel? Because pop people often have post-infectious irritable oh. bowel syndrome. People can get it after antibiotics. People can get it after any kind of stress or trauma. And, you know, and people don't realize that it, it's connected to so many different things. So let's talk about, you know, what are the, the causes? And then we'll go into sort of a case of how we would deal with this. So what, what are the, what are the top causes uh, that you found in functional medicine that are driving irritable bowel syndrome for people? Well, a lot of irritable bowel also is probably misdiagnosed, I think, as sort of SIBO. I think a large number of, and SIBO is this diagnosis of, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So a, a bunch of people with irritable bowel have SIBO or exactly. bad bugs growing where they shouldn't be in the small intestine. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I, I think that we're, we're sort of finding that a lot of these people that we're diagnosing with this catch-all term is real. They're really having potentially small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There are tests that you can do for that. Uh, we do the... That's also known as a food baby. When you eat food and you get a big bloated tummy right after, and as a food baby, that's what SIBO is. Right. Because what what's happening is is the, you know, there's we have bacteria on our skin. We have bacteria in our mouth. We have bacteria in our stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine. Most of them sort of live in the, in the colon. But there are times when the, the colonic bacteria start migrating upwards uh, and they go higher up. And it's sort of like, you know, invading a neighborhood. That's, yeah. You know, it's, and, and they it's mostly of, sterile up there. Most it's yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's, it's not it's it's I think it was not not necessarily that we always thought it was sterile. But even the stomach has bacteria. In right. It. Um, and, but it's just much less. And they're all different kinds of bacteria. So the the lower uh, bacteria are more fermenters. They they ferment things. Yeah. And that's where we get. I think I have talked about that. I, and I uh, I've seen this a couple of times the auto brewery syndrome where patients. In fact, I just recently had a patient. Fantastic uh, case, and he actually heard me uh, uh, on one of the podcasts where I was talking about auto brewery syndrome. So I, I, uh, I did a consult with him, and he ended up going and buying a breathalyzer. Yeah, and he confirmed that he has auto brewery syndrome because he was producing alcohol. He was driving over the limit. He was driving. <laughs> yeah, he was just short of the well, limit. Saves you money on beer for sure. <laughs> it was no. It was, it was actually quite interesting because he he actually was doing a very strict low carb, no sugar diet, and even with a really really good diet, he was pushing uh, making alcohol. It was really yeah. quite interesting. Uh, so yeah. So but anyway, so uh, you know, talking about you know how do we how do we diagnose this? So you can do uh, stool testing. I like the, uh, the the GI map test where you can do quantitative uh, PCR for bacteria, yeast, uh, fungi. So that's looking for the like the genetic material of the different bugs. Yeah, it's like CSI. Yeah, you see CSI. It's it's. it's I find it to be a very uh, very helpful tool. Um, you can also do the uh, uh, hydrogen methane breath test. Um, although the thing about the hydrogen methane breath test is that I've had some patients who have significant, you know, irritable bowel, SIBO type symptoms. They're bloating. And they're negative. And they're negative. And I think based upon my reading of the literature is that they're probably producing hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. Uh, and I think that when you just sort of get a history of, you know, they pass very foul smelling gas, it yeah. smells like rotten eggs. That's usually the, the people that are producing hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. People um, don't realize that, you know, cows just don't produce methane. Humans can produce methane. Exactly. If you have this. And we measure that coming out in your breath. We measure hydrogen. We have you yeah. take this drink? And that's really a clue that there may be these bugs growing in there and they have to be treated directly. And that can really help a lot of people. Oh, huge, huge, huge amounts. Yeah. And, and, and it's often missed. It's, it's, it's very much missed. And, and, and you also have to do the test properly uh, because, you know, everybody produces small, small amounts of hydrogen and methane. It's just that you want it lower down in mm. the colon and it really be, that doesn't, doesn't become as much of a clinical issue. Um, the other thing is to also think about in those types of patients is to make sure that they have sufficient amounts of stomach acid. Mm. Stomach acid is very, very important uh, at uh, helping with the proper digestion. Uh, so uh, you can actually do uh, testing for gastrin levels. Uh, and I've been surprised at how many people have high gastrin levels. So when you're, you don't have enough stomach acid, your body produces more gastrin, which is the hormone to you know, pump out more 
hydrochloric acid. It's like acid. flogging a dead horse. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would I would venture to say that most people's uh, issues are not high acid in the stomach. It's low acid. Yeah. It's low acid. And we're taking more of these acid blockers, which, by the way, also cause irritable bowel. In fact, <laughs> so they help your heartburn, you, but they you, cause trouble bowel. <laughs> and, and, and now there are, there is a role for short-term use of these, these acid blockers, like in the ICU. The studies have been shown they've been very helpful yeah, to course. prevent stress-induced ulcers and uh, 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 hospital-acquired pneumonia. But they're really to be used short term. And when you start using them long term, they are very toxic. Yeah. They are very toxic. They produce uh, increased intestinal permeability. They uh, cause malabsorption of nutrients, uh, vitamin B12, iron, other trace Magnesium, minerals. Zinc, yeah. Yeah. And, and they cause bacterial overgrowth. And, and they cause osteoporosis and pneumonia. Uh, and absolutely. Oh, yeah. Huge. Huge. And, huge. huge. Yeah. And I actually. I, 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 I am really surprised that these things are over the counter. They really should not be over the counter. Yeah, no, I remember, I, we've, I've talked about this before, but I remember when I was in medical school, the rep, these just came out and the drug rep yeah. was like, these are super powerful drugs. You never want to give them more than six weeks. They're designed <laughs> to treat ulcers. After six weeks, you got to stop them. Don't take them long term. And now people eat them like candy all day long, every day. And I'm like, this is not good. And we see so many complications from that. So if you're irritable bowel, uh, is there and you have these acid blockers that you're taking, there might be a correlation. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do and introducing you to all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I wanna tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter. And I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger longer. Now back to this week's episode. So we talked about SIBO and we, we talked, we could talk about how to treat that, but essentially it's killing the bad bugs and reseeding the gut. And, and what other things are driving your bowel besides that? Well, also you can also uh, potentially have uh, problems with uh, part of the intestine that causes peristalsis. So normally you think of the, the gut as like this conveyor belt that's always moving things through. So you eat and within about 24 hours, everything should sort of move through. And there are some patients, especially with the patients who have uh, problems with constipation, that will have problems with uh, uh, motility or really motility disorders. And there's a uh, test. Just not moving down. Not moving down. And there's a there's a, a part of the intestines which is called the migrating motor complex. And you can actually test for antibodies against the uh, the migrating motor complex. It's called IBS Sure test. And I'll do that. In it's some... almost like an autoimmune thing. Yeah, it's 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 like a little bit like a paralysis, if yeah. you will, or a weakening of the of the gut. And we talked about that earlier. How um, you you in some cases, and uh, you'll have patients who have uh, Lyme disease. I actually had a, a very good integrative gastroenterologist who brought my attention to this is that he had a lot of patients who had refractory SIBO. Yeah. So, they, you know, SIBO was one of those things where it sometimes can come back and oftentimes does come back. And what he was finding is that some of his more difficult patients with refractory SIBO actually had underlying Lyme disease and Lyme disease affects the nervous system. Yes. He, he tied the two together uh, because uh, there is a, as a paper, it's called Bell's palsy of the gut. And uh, in fact, uh, Bell's palsy is a, where you get facial paralysis. Yeah. And I'll never forget this. When I was uh, in my private practice, I had a, the first time I uh, saw a real acute a case of Lyme disease, the patient presented with Bell's palsy. So yeah. her face was paralyzed. And I did testing on her and the patient had acute Lyme disease. And that is one of the known complications. Yeah. And it's thought that also that Lyme disease can actually affect the gut and you get paralysis and, and, and decreased motility of the gut. Yeah, so so that is a very important point because you know there are the typical things that go on: food sensitivities, yep. gluten, dairy. Some people react to the chemicals in food that are food additives, food additives, food colorings, food colorings, sugar, alcohols, people emulsifiers, emulsifiers, all these things that are in our junction processed food <laughs> do have a huge impact on people. Uh, there's obviously the SIBO. So many people get parasites. Uh, yeah, we, we, little you know, little uh, microscopic hitchhikers. Yeah, and there's and there's there's one called blastocystis, which is really common. It doesn't it doesn't cause a horrible disease, yeah. but it can cause irritable bowel. And about thirty percent of people with IBS 
Oh yeah, have this. I, I, I want to yeah. venture to say that I have picked up a lot of these. I call them little microscopic hitchhikers. And when you actually look in the in the mainstream literature, they, they you know they, they basically say that you know a lot of these you don't need to treat it. So there are times when somebody can you know they have dientamoeba uh, histolytica and uh, uh, blastocystis, and sometimes uh, endolimax nana. And sometimes people will have these and they'll have a small amount of them and they may not cause any symptoms whatsoever. Right. But if I find them in the in the stool test and patients are having symptoms, I treat them. Yeah, absolutely. And then and then there's also other things. People have like enzyme deficiencies we can see on stool tests without not digesting their food well. Yep. Um, and also, um, you know, for me, I, I had terrible irritable bowel, you know, almost 30 years ago. It was from mercury poisoning because mercury affects all your enzymes. It basically interrupts the enzyme function of many different enzymes throughout your body, including your gut. And until I got rid of the mercury, my irritable bowel wouldn't go away no matter what I did. Yeah. I just ate turkey and broccoli and brown rice for six months and nothing yeah. worked. And, and that's and that's and, 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 and so you have to keep being a detective and thinking about what are all the variable causes. And we look at the stool testing, we look at breath testing for bacterial overgrowth, we look at uh, organic acid urine testing yep. to see if there's markers of bugs in there. Uh, and we, we sometimes dig down deeper to look at things like metals or Lyme or t other tick infections. So there is a real deep thinking about what is going on with this person. And it's guided by their history, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's, it's personalized. It really is. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's totally personalized and it takes time to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it, it may take several visits. I mean, you you, you, we have, you and I have had patients where we've been seeing them for a long extended yeah. period of time and they're, you know, they're get, they make some progress, they get better, uh, they mm. may backslide, they yeah. may, you know, then they'll have, they'll have incremental uh, things. So we sort of uncover the, as you say, the layers of the onion. Yeah, no, it's true. I, I, I had a very bizarre case once, they just reminded me of who was suffering terribly from digestive issues for years and years, was overall systemically inflamed. And it turned out he had Babesia, which affected his gut. Wow. He also had histamine intolerance. Histamine, yeah, that's another uh, one. Meaning yeah. Uh, there are histamines in food. And, and so he, we, we put him on a low histamine diet. We treated his, his, um, his Babesia and his symptoms got better. So it, sometimes it's a little bit of a roundabout way to think about yep. it. But um, what, what case have you seen in, in, in your practice that have sort of stood out for you around irritable bowel? Oh, I recently had a patient who came in with a diagnosis of irritable bowel. You know, mm -hmm. that, was, that was the official diagnosis. And uh, interestingly, she gave me through the history that, you know, her symptoms seemed to have been triggered when she had Lyme disease. And her Lyme disease also was complicated by POTS, which we've talked about before, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia, which basically means that you have autonomic nervous system dysfunction as relationship to Lyme. So that sort of- it Means when you stand up, you get dizzy. Yeah, when you stand up, you get dizzy and your heart starts going really fast. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, there are certain, a couple of things that, you know, when, that uh, make me think about Lyme disease. So when I have a patient who's got POTS, and sometimes people just come in and that's their only their only yeah. diagnosis is POTS. I said, okay, well, why do they have POTS? Yeah, I, I, lo I love medical terms. Postural orthostatic hypotension, which is called POTS. <laughs> it sounds like a fancy diagnosis. What does it mean? It means when you stand up, your blood pressure drops. It doesn't tell you anything about why or what caused it. And it's just, it's like so frustrating to me that nobody's keeps thinking about what's going on here with these patients so they can actually fix the problem. Right, right. So so this lady had this history of, of, of Lyme and, uh, and POTS, and then she uh, ended up having uh, cancer of the uterus and uh, went through radiation. She was supposed to get like 25 rounds of radiation. She had to stop at 12 because mm -hmm. she developed diarrhea. Uh -huh. Um, and uh, called radiation colitis. Radiation uh, colitis, radiation enteritis, exactly. And um, Believe it or not, you know the doctors who were treating her said, "Oh, that has nothing to do with your symptoms." I mean, they they literally, you know, they didn't want to they didn't want to you know admit that it was from the radiation. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. And then she came in and she actually had had some testing done uh, previously. And what I what what and I think the doctor who actually did the testing didn't know what, uh, what how to uh, interpret the test properly, but uh, the patient's calprotectin was elevated. So calprotectin is a an, uh, a biomarker in the gut. It's, I call it like uh, CRP of the gut. So we have this, this compound, which is called uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. When it's elevated, it uh, is a biomarker of systemic inflammation, and it's also highly correlated with heart disease. And um, calprotectin is found in the gut, and it's sort of like the CRP of the gut. So when you see so that- you see it's high inflammation. Yeah, exactly. So it tells you, and usually, you know, for classic, you know, what we 
call irritable bowel syndrome, you don't usually have inflammation per se. There's not really mm. dramatic inflammation. There's dysfunction, but there's not inflammation. So her irritable bowel was actually partly inflammation. Mm. Um, and, and I think that was uh, uh, one of the big things that was uh, driving it. The other thing on this particular patient is that she had on her testing uh, undetectable acromancy mesinophilia. That's a big so, word. Acr all right, all right. So, so this what is, is a, a it's a it's a mucus loving bacteria, and what we found is that higher levels of this is correlated with leaner body mass, less chance of obesity, less chance of diabetes, and uh, it's also uh, uh, you want to have higher levels of this because it's a protective good bug. It's and not. It's not. It's not a probiotic. Autoimmune disease. And yeah. Let, increased let's risk of cancer. If it's yeah. Slower. yeah. So and it's not a. It's not a bug that you can go out and get a pill for. At least not yet. Uh, eventually we might because uh, it's so so beneficial. But what we find out is that this particular bacteria feeds on uh, fibers, specifically polyphenols. Um, what so are those? Polyphenols are those compounds that are uh, uh, phytonutrients found in lots of colorful f uh, foods and vegetables, things like pomegranate and uh, green tea and cranberry. Cranberries, yeah. So your little bugs like cranberry, pomegranates, and green tea. <laughs> exactly, they love that stuff. This is their, you know, I call it the miracle girl. You yeah. know, that's a miracle girl. You put this stuff on there, and the good bugs flourish. There's a fairly new understanding, you know, because we thought, okay, you need prebiotics, you need probiotics, but I think the polyphenols are yeah. also critically important uh, to optimizing your gut flora, the three Ps. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and the, the other thing, which I always come back to when I, when I think about the digestive tract is, is uh, it's a beautiful visual, is the rainforest. And for anybody who knows about rainforest, rainforests are full of biodiversity. There's lots of flora and fauna. There's frogs, there's birds, there's all different, you know, plants, insects, worms. And the more biodiversity that you have in your personal internal rainforest, the mm. healthier you're going to be. Mm. And there's 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 tons of studies that have shown this, and it's a it's it's nonlinear. It's very very complex because there's this whole ecosystem, and there's this cross feeding and interaction that happens when you have a diverse uh, internal rainforest. Yeah, it's so true. You know, I was talking to a, a professor at Harvard who's a psychiatrist and also runs the Department of Nutritional Psychiatry, and she's written a book. Uh, called This Is Your Brain on Food, talking about the microbiome and its effect on psychiatric illness. Absolutely. So we, we used to think that, you know, the crazy person would have the gut problems. Turns out the gut problem people have the crazy thing upstairs because of the gut thing. And fixing the gut fixes the depression, anxiety, OCD, all these crazy things that we, we thought of our psychiatric illnesses. Yeah. Turns out they're really related to the yeah. imbalances in the microbiome and the lower diversity. And yeah. Western societies have increasingly lower diversity. Oh, huge, huge, yeah, yeah. exactly, and, and it happens very, very early on. Is and what what typically will happen is 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 um you know there are there are some people that you know they're they're you know they're very picky eaters and they mm. will they'll be eating the same food over and over and over. Yeah. And um you know I always tell patients that you know you want to try to increase your uh, intake of diverse fruits, vegetables, you know, try to eat and see right now in the Berkshires, you know, we have lots of great uh, uh, vegetables that are available that you may not get year round. Um, and, you know, eating, uh, I, I call it, you know, you want to eat a Crayola crayon box. The more color you have in your diet, the, the healthier your diet's going to be. And I, you know, I want to come back to something you said before about this inflammation in the gut. There's a whole new phenomenon we call pre-inflammatory bowel disease. So we thought irritable bowel wasn't inflammatory. It turns out even if you can't always detect it, it's, it tends to be very inflammatory. And there are there are cases like you saw of people with this pre-IBD. So it's like pre-Crohn's or pre-colitis. Yeah, it's not like one, and, uh, one night you wake up and all of a sudden you've got Crohn's disease. Yeah, exactly. and so there's this level of, of this yeah. marker we check. And it's often elevated and people have, you know, not full-blown Crohn's disease, but something's going on in there that's driving inflammation. And you have to deal with those factors. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So so this patient, she also had elevated gluten antibodies, right? So she had this low acromancia. She had yeah, elevated, gluten, elevated antibodies. gluten antibodies and this yep. high calprotectin. Yep. And, and so this is a sort of a perfect setup for having a messed up gut. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So how, do you, how would you take care of this patient then who came in with the gluten issues, the low acromancia, and the calprotectin? Well, I mean, to, to address the inflammation- And by uh, the way, these are something that your traditional doctor will never look for, right. that we usually uh, look for in functional medicine at the Ultra Wellness Center, yeah. sort of 
standard operating procedure for us to really look at these things. Yeah. So, so you know, to, to, to treat inflammation, I always like to check uh, the omega-3 fatty acids. Because um, when you have low uh, essential fatty acids, you're a setup for inflammation. So in this particular patient, the patient had suboptimal omega-3 fatty acids, which are related to eating cold water fish. So I got her to uh, take some uh, supplemental uh, omega-3 fatty acids, had her increase her fish intake. Uh, I used an anti-inflammatory uh, 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 supplement uh, called Ultra Inflamex, which mm. has uh, it's, it has a, a powder curcumin and other things to help decrease inflammation uh, in the gut. Ginger, rosemary, G exactly. Yeah. Ginger and rosemary, exactly. And then also used uh, Interagam, which is a uh, immunoglobin um, that helps with uh, patients who have uh, sort of uh, diarrhea type. Uh, that's actually a prescription medication. So, so tell us more about what it, what is this immunoglobulin stuff? Because you hear a lot about it, and yeah, it's it's serum bovine uh, derived uh, immunoglobin, and it's basically colostrum. Yeah, you can think of it as like colostrum. I mean, yeah, colostrum mm -hmm. is, you know, colostrum is that stuff that in mother's milk that is before the milk uh, comes on. And it so gives immunity to the baby. Exactly. It gives right. Yeah, it's it's so passive immunity. So it, it's the mother's immune system that's passed down to the child. So, mm -hmm. which is really quite amazing when you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, that the mother's immune system has evolved and learned what to deal with and how to deal with it. And then that immune system gets literally transferred in the breast milk to the baby. Until the baby can actually develop its own. Exactly, exactly. Right. So, and, and, and the interesting thing is our immune system has to learn. It's yeah. got. It's got to be. Edgy. It's got to go to school. Yeah. And 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 that's why you know when you see these little kids who are crawling around on the ground and they're putting stuff in their mouth, we're developing what's called mucosal tolerance. It's yeah. the immune system learning to deal with the planet Earth, and it, it's you know it, it realizes that okay you're going to be around a lot of these things you don't want to overreact to it. Um, and I, so, I, you know, we, we always talk about, you know, what is a healthy immune system? Well, a healthy immune system is a tolerant immune system. Yeah. It doesn't overreact or underreact. Exactly. It, it, that's, that's the key thing. And I always say to people, I want a strong immune system. Well, if you have a too strong immune system, that's called autoimmune disease. Right. When your body's reacting to everything and it's like overreacting. So, uh, having, uh, tolerance and mucosal tolerance is really, really important. And the other thing, which I, in some of the lectures I do, and I, I, I like to emphasize this is. You can think of, you know, we have the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and unfortunately, Tanglewood is is not <laughs> not open this season because of COVID. But in the Boston Symphony Orchestra, you have the conductor, and the conductor, you know, balances the the the, the woodwinds and the and the strings and everything, and they sort of keep everything in balance. And in the immune system, we have uh, cells called the T reg cells. And the T reg cells regulate the immune system between the, the various parts of so the- So like make sure it's not too hot, not too cold. Exactly, exactly. And guess what helps with T reg cells? Fiber. What? Fiber. Yes, so the, when you're eating lots of fiber, you upregulate your T reg cells. Uh, other things that can do that, vitamin A can do that too, but, but fiber is probably one of the biggest things that helps with the T reg cells. Yeah, and functional medicine is really- uh practical too, because when you have a patient with any condition, particularly with gut issues, which is often driving so many things. So even if you don't have quote irritable bowel, a lot of health conditions are driven by imbalances in the gut. Like we talked about psychiatric issues, heart disease, obesity. Uh, but we have a very specific framework called the 5R program, which we yep. use to methodically treat and restore gut function. And we've been doing it for decades, even before people called it the microbiome. Our goal was to really optimize the microbiome as a way of treating all sorts of diseases. So how how would we do that in this patient? Obviously, you got rid of the gluten, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, in in a, in a patient uh, in a patient to uh, decrease inflammation, uh, you can decrease the foods that you know typically uh, drive inflammation. So things like trans fats can drive inflammation. Sugar drives inflammation. Um, dairy, a big thing. Uh, especially cow's milk. Uh, mm. Sheep and goats tend to be less inflammatory. I'm not sure why that it's is. This is the A2 casein. Oh, A2 casein. Okay, that's yeah. it. There you go. A2 yeah, A1 casein. casein is very inflammatory, which is all the modern cows. All the heirloom cows and sheep and goats still have A2 casein, which is less inflammatory. It yeah. tends to cause less digestive issues for people. Yeah. And then uh, gluten is a, is a big driver. And then other things that um, you know are found in foods, uh, like we talked about, things like emulsifiers and artificial processed foods. processed foods. Exactly. If you can't read it on a label, don't eat it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't don't eat it. Um, the another one, which is I'll mention this, is uh, titanium dioxide. Yes, I was just reading about that. Exactly. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's bad. It's a, it's a thing that they add to food to white give it, give it white whitening. 
and they'll use it in a lot of products, gums. They use it in such. It's in a lot and, of vitamins you get at the at the drugstore too. <laughs> exactly, and and titanium. Your, your body does not like titanium. It's not. It's a, it's a metal, and uh, it, your body can react to it. And it's it's almost like a nanoparticle metal that you're mm. putting in the body, and uh, it's been shown to uh, the, the gut does not like it. Yeah, one more reason to not eat processed food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Exactly. So so you've gotten we're removing the foods. We're removing. These processed ingredients, moving trans fats, gluten, dairy, other food sensitivities. I had a patient, for example, I had diarrhea for years and years. She had a sensitivity to eggs. It wasn't an allergy. She got rid of the eggs and her diarrhea went away. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then there are some times where, you know, doing a strict elimination diet to try to tease out because food is complex. There's lots of things when you're eating food. Mm -hmm. And there are also some, some patients that you, I know you've probably done it yourself where sometimes you've got to put them on what's called an elemental diet. Yeah. Where you basically give them the, a, a, a amino pre digested, pre -digested exactly. Yeah. And that helps to sort of calm down and quiet the gut. In fact, mainstream doctors will do that for patients where they'll, uh, they'll actually put them on parental uh, nutrition, where they just give them it through the, they sort of rest the gut. Yeah. I mean, we're going to be having a podcast with one of our nutritionists. We're going to be talking about the elimination diet and why we do it and how we do it. And there's lots of different versions, particularly for IBS, the FODMAP diet. There's a specific carbohydrate diet. There's yeah. a traditional elimination diet. So I think I think this is a and a really important thing is to get rid of the things that are causing the problem. Yeah. And then we look for parasites and other bad bugs, SIBO, breath testing. So we actually clear out all the bad stuff. Yep. And yeah. Take out take out the bad and put in the good. What's the next step for how to repair the gut on the five R program? Uh, well, you can you can uh, re inoculate. You can, sometimes you can use probiotics along with prebiotics. We call that symbiotics. The, the big thing you got to watch out with that, and you've probably seen this, is if you add that in too soon, you can actually sometimes flare up bloating symptoms. Yeah. It's like yeah. a war between the good guys and the bad guys. So you got to clear out the bad guys first. I call it the weeding, seeding, and feeding program. First, you got to do the weeding, then you got to seed the good guys, and then you got to feed them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then the other thing that's also important, just that sort of helps with digestion, is, and, and I've been using this more and more, is stimulation of the vagus nerve. So, the, the vagus nerve, um, you can, we have the autonomic nervous system in the body. And there's I, I, this, my analogy is the, the gas pedal and the brakes. And mm. the gas pedal is a sympathetic, so it sort of gets things going. And the brakes sort of slow things down. So the stimulating of the vagus nerve is resting and digesting. Mm. And that's what you want to be doing. You want to be in a relaxed state when you're, when you're digesting your food. Um, and we tend to have a sympathetically driven society, you know, yeah. we're running, going, we're, you know, uh, always on the go. So like people say prayers or grace before eating to calm everything down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and we yeah. just kind of eat on the run, eat on the car. Yeah. And people walking down the street. And we, we're all guilty of that. People we, watching TV. Yeah. Well, that, that the worst thing is actually I call it unconscious eating. You know, it's like you're sitting in front of watching a movie and you get the popcorn. All of a sudden the big bowl's gone. <laughs> well, they, they actually did those studies where they literally have a secret trap door on the bottom of the bowl and they like fill it up from the bottom <laughs> and people just keep eating and eating. Exactly. <laughs> Unconscious eating. It's like, it's like stop. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so the five R program is basically remove the bad stuff, uh, basically replace the things that are missing. The digestive enzymes, like digestive stomach enzymes acid. and prebiotics, re-inoculate and then repair, which is repair, the next yeah. phase, which is how do you fix a leaky gut? Right. Yeah, and that, that's you know you talked about butyrate. Butyrate is one of the things that's very helpful for leaky gut, and I've been using that uh, in in uh, supplement form. Yeah, uh, I also encourage you know fiber fiber use, and um, uh, glutamine can be very helpful. Mm. Uh, aloe is can be really helpful. Uh, quercetin or yeah. other other things that vitamin A, zinc, zinc, fish oil, zinc yeah. yeah, zinc uh, zinc in the form of zinc carnosine is also there's some really interesting studies on that with leaky gut, because um, when you take things like uh, Advil or uh, uh, Aleve, those things cause transient leaky gut. Mm. So you're gonna have, you're gonna develop leaky gut. And for people who are taking them chronically, they've shown that just taking zinc will help repair the gut with uh, the NSAIDs. So it's really a very specific methodology of diagnosis and treatment. And, and you know, the hit rate is pretty high on this. I mean, I, I think, you know, people come in with these chronic lifelong digestive issues. I, mean, I just talked to a patient yesterday and she'd been struggling, struggling, struggling. Didn't know she had a parasite, she had bacterial overgrowth, she had all these issues. And within a couple of weeks, she's back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I think people are just sort of shocked. And one of the things you use with this patient is, is a gut shake that oh, right, right, kind of combines shake. a lot of these things yep. um, that help grow her acromancia. Exactly. Yeah. So this, uh, the gut shake is, is full of polyphenols, it contains uh, things like cranberry, uh, pomegranate, uh, maca. 
uh, matcha, 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 matcha. I call it matcha. <laughs> <laughs> Green tea. And matcha, matcha, right, right. Matcha, not matcha, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's got the immunoglobulins, which yep. are, yep. which you talked about, that help kind of regulate the immune system in the gut. Right. Pre and prebiotic fibers, yep. probiotics. Yeah, and, and, and I, again, this, I call this sort of like, you know, miracle grow for your rainforest. It yeah. just helps with biodiversity. It helps with this uh, flourishing of the good good guys, which which have their own way of of keeping things in, in check. It's, it really is. So uh, for those listening who have irritable bowel, who've been suffering for a long time without help, there is help. Uh, you don't have to suffer. It's actually not that hard to fix. It's sort of embarrassing how easy it is once you know what to do. Uh, but most of us in medicine, we're not trained on how to approach this systemically or systematically. And that's what functional medicine is. It's a systematic approach that looks at the causes and then restores normal function, hence the term, name functional medicine. And we've been doing this at the Ultra Wellness here for, gosh, I don't know, decades now. Uh, with all of us together, we probably have 65 years of clinical experience and we all are faculty and teach all over the world. So I think your, you know, your, your stories and my stories just you know, go back so many years and help us really know that uh, we have a way through this and people don't have to suffer. So exactly. people are listening and struggling. I encourage you to get help through a functional medicine doctor here at the Ultra Wellness Center. We're doing all virtual visits now. People, well, we also, you can come in for sure, but we do virtual so you can get a new patient virtual consults. Uh, and, and we're really happy to help anybody who, who needs help because this is a terrible problem to suffer with. <laughs> and, yeah. and there are answers and there's a way to figure it out. And it ain't that hard. And I personally have suffered from it. So I get it. And it's just no fun. No. So I, I think, uh, Todd, you are a wealth of knowledge. And I'm so glad to have you back on the podcast. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering out there if, if you've struggled with this, please uh, share your story with us. Leave a comment and uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And um uh, we would love to have you share this with everybody because I think there's a lot of people out there with Irwell Bowel. And, and uh, we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. We, we want to have everyone to have happy guts. Happy gut. Happy gut. <laughs>